everyone, welcome back to my channel. So today I have a special guest with me, Fatimina. She featured in my Academia and Beyond event that I posted in my previous video. Uh, she's a speaker, she's also an academic just like me. Um, she's an engineer by background. Did her PhD at UCL, so I think she has a lot to say. We had a very different experience. I think it's really important to highlight the differences that uh, PhDs can have and like the experience that we can have because it's not all roses um, which yeah. is what I kind of made it out to be but it's not all like it's not always like that so I'm here to kind of Q&A Fatimina and find out how her experience was and things like that. We asked Instagram for some questions we both have questions that we're going to pick so I'm gonna pick like five six questions or if you do like this video please make sure that you like this video please subscribe to the channel and leave us a comment and let us know what other questions you have and maybe we can do a part two? Yeah, yeah. let's do that. We can do a part yeah. two. Um, I'll leave her Instagram and all her details down below. Okay. Let's get into it. So, what's your first question? Okay, oh my god. Um, is PhD worth it in terms of career progression? My answer would be like, even though my experience wasn't all roses and flowers, mm. I would definitely say that a PhD is worth it. It depends. If you're somebody who wants to go into academia, you definitely need a PhD. Oh, Anyone so. that says that you don't need it, yeah. it's lying. Uh, in terms of career progression, it's not like it will give you like a well-paid job straight away yeah. But the one thing that you have is you have these skills that will push you to get to like a really well-paid job much faster than other people would I think having a PhD is quite useful not only in academia but also outside academia because you yeah. have just so many skills that you build through your PhD you become like a multi kind of faceted person so yeah you can progress up the career ladder quite you're quite resilient to a lot of stuff yeah, I feel like definitely do your PhD you become quite resilient because you have to deal with your experiments not working your western blots not working not you know everything exactly. doesn't work with bacteria in your cells so once you've dealt with all that stress you can do anything else I think exactly yeah. so no. job suggestions to do whilst studying part-time masters I would say try to stick to your field yeah. so if you're doing a masters in I don't know like science or, or education or health or something maybe tutor I think that would be a good idea. Oh, definitely. So do tuition, so you can tutor A-level students and you can get like at least 30, 40, even 50 yeah. pounds an hour depending on like what area you work in. Because we're just talking about it now, you could be doing proofreading. Yeah. I mean, by yeah. by this time, you know you're good at it. Yeah. So definitely, you have the skills that you maybe you don't even realise that you have. Yeah. And it will show in your CV as well. When people look at your CV, they don't just want to see your academic side, they want to see your like your extracurricular side as yeah. well. What else can you bring to the table? Because they can find anyone with a degree. Exactly. That's not something that's challenging for employers these days. Yeah. But what they want is someone that has more than that. I think it's so important and so underrated. Always, if you're able to also do work experiences, there are a lot of people that, are, like this, for example, the EPSRC, you can do these summer programs and yeah. get paid for it. You get yeah. paid for doing like something. Like research internships. Exactly. Like two months, one month, six weeks. You learn about like the lab, yeah. you make connections, yeah. you get paid. Win, win, win. Yeah. <laughs> what would you do if you wanted to do a PhD but the family were not supportive? Ooh. I don't even remember if my family was supportive or not. All I remember is everyone telling me, are you doing four more years of studying? <laughs> oh, yeah. The way I explained it to my family wasn't really I am studying, was more like I'm actually getting paid yeah. to be working in the lab yeah. and I'll be teaching people as well. And most of the time families can't really say no yeah. if it's like education related, especially yeah. in my culture. If it's like education related, you can get away with a lot. Anything. So your parents, why you want to do it, or your family, why do you want to do it? Like what are your reasons? What say to them for example like if you want to go into lecturing you say to them like I have to get a PhD to do this like I yeah. can't do it without a PhD yeah. or if you're passionate about something just make sure that you're really com you communicating with them like you're, you're really clear about what it is you're doing that you're not just messing around for another three or four yeah. years um, and that you're getting paid like I know it's not a lot but you are getting paid for it and yeah. it's tax free so you know, it's like having a job basically. Except I think you're maybe the struggle would be it's not really the PhD itself. It's like some people do self fund themselves when they do a PhD. Don't do that. Like yeah. I would never self fund myself. People should be paying you for doing that work. So no, uh, you can find funding even if you're an international student. Yeah. You can always find funding. Go for it. Your family can't say anything once and once they see that you're an independent human being. Yeah. But obviously, if you're taking money from them to support yeah. you to do that. That's a then struggle. Yeah, then it's like, come on, you're 22, 23, 24. Exactly. You should be helping us financially. We should yeah. be helping you at this point. But so if you're depends. getting paid and yeah. it's tax free as well, 
they can't say they anything. Can't say anything so, yeah. But just yeah. just show them how passionate you are. Yeah. And it should be. How difficult is a master's compared to a PhD? That's a good one because we got, we got asked that the other day as well. At that yeah. Semester. I actually think my master's was more challenging than my PhD. Yeah. Because I think once you've got to the PhD stage, you've got it. Like you understand how it works. Yeah. So it's just, okay, it's four, four years long, but you understand the system. Whereas when you're in your master's, you're just coming out of your undergraduate, which is like all taught lessons and lectures. Yeah. And you're going to this master's where it's all independent work. And I feel like that was more of a challenge to me yeah. than my PhD, personally. But content wise, they're both very similar because they're both research and you're both like doing, you yeah. have to do yeah. reading and stuff. But I feel like the jump is greater from undergrad to master's than it was master to PhD. Yeah. So for me, my master's was more challenging. Yeah, I would well. say, and you're just, and also it's only one year, and everything has to happen so quickly. Yeah, you've got six months to do a project, three months really to do it, one month to figure it out a little bit, one month to write. Yeah, so like you, you've got three months to find for, to get results. I would That's say exactly. like three the masters is much more intensive because there is so much less time. Yeah. But I also feel like the expectations that are put on you, yeah. they're not as high as the expectations that would be put on like a PhD student. Yeah. Like with a PhD student, you have that pressure of, oh my goodness, I'm spending yeah. three to four years on this thing. What if I don't get data yeah. that is that relevant? I think the issue with the PhD is that there's a lot of like mental pressure mm -hmm. that is given to you. Like, you know, because you're like, you, you think you, you come out of it like you know with top of top yeah. marks and experience and everything else and you think you're gonna do amazing and yeah. things are gonna fail and they're not gonna fail just for one year they're gonna be failing for like yeah. a couple of years you know some people get they get yeah. results like quickly depending on the area of research but if you're like in science and engineering yeah. things will fail, fail yeah. and work and also like you in the, in your head you have this thing called publishing yeah and you don't really understand it until like i said to your yeah. phd so i feel like you go to the masters and you're like i want to publish yeah. not realizing that it takes a year to even get any results yeah and then a year to to write up the paper yeah and then you submit the paper and more edits so you're not yeah. going to publish anything during your masters unless you're lucky and something was already in the pipeline and you managed to catch well, it at the end is if you caught it at the end then it's yeah. yes or if you catch it during the edits yeah and let's say you started the lab during the edits yeah then it's cool but if you started a project during your masters, you're not going to publish until because my masters project was published last year. Yeah, four years after my masters. My PhD was in stem cells, and I thought by the time I get mm. to my PhD, I'm going to have three, four papers. Yeah, stem cells take about a week. Some take a month yeah. to grow. Things fail, and you know, even though I may be publishing papers, I have not published as many papers as I would have wanted. wanted. Yeah. yeah. How do you get through moments where you're demotivated? Oh my gosh. Like what what is it? Why did you start? Yeah. Like what what was your aim? What did you want from the PhD? Did you want to become an academic? Did you want to become a lecturer? Did you want to become a PI? Yeah. Once you've got that into your head, you remember that life has its ups and downs. Yeah. And PhD is no different. Like you're gonna have your ups, you're gonna have your downs. Yeah. So once you remember that, I feel like it does make it a bit easier because you remind yourself that any pain is temporary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like a life like motto. Yeah, pain is temporary. And any bacteria you have in your cells, any bl blots that don't work, any experiments that work, don't work, will work after some troubleshooting. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, during the time that you're demotivated, maybe you feel like things are not working or you don't really care or feel the same way about your PhD anymore, there's a reason or something that caused that. Yeah. You are in your PhD because you enjoy it. So if you're feeling demotivated, something has caused that demotivation. Yeah. So you need to find the root of it and then try to think, okay, how can I get over this? It goes back to, you know, not everyone is made to be doing a PhD. No. You know, especially you think, you assume that because you're a top student, suddenly you get... And that's one thing that I have against the education system. So thing because people are tested doing exams and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Maybe you may be amazing at exams, but you're just not that good at yeah. when it comes to practical stuff. Um, or working so, with people which PhD exactly yeah <laughs> I mean things will be failing you yeah. need to be prepared for that let me go back to the literature let me see if I can optimize yeah. this I was doing a lot of optimization I was not scared of asking for help like I, I would meet to. people in conferences and I'll to. be like yeah. oh so that experiment worked for you like yeah. what sort of things were you doing some people even send me their protocols yeah. you know yeah, some people yeah, were yeah, really yeah. nice things started to work like you have to keep on pushing yeah. and sometimes there's this thing that if that you know students are just scared like to try mm -hmm. this experiment because they already assume it's not going to work and they can't take it well you're not a scientist if you want everything to be perfect yeah. that's not how you learn things that's not how the science, not how science process works. that's yeah. not how science works. works it goes back to academia mm -hmm. bad data is still data you yeah, know what I mean? you can prove that something doesn't work 
Yeah. That's still poo. Because uh, th there was this experiment, I have repeated it eight to nine times, and sometimes you can yeah. only repeat it three times, I repeated it eight to nine times, because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't me, yeah. it was an experiment. <laughs> yeah. I realized it was you feel like it's you. Exactly. You like, feel like it's you. Working. But you keep on pushing, you keep yeah. on being like, you know what, what is not working, as yeah. she said, like, you know, and then you optimize on that, and then when things work, Amazing. Yeah. That amazing feeling. Yeah. So keep on pushing. And then something else fails. <laughs> but you just have to keep on going. Like honestly, just keep on going. And you learn a lot about life as well, yeah, like, right? Fear is part of life. Yeah. Uh, so my next question. <laughs> I question number six. Um, do you find a PhD on new websites uh, and then decide from there, or do you go to specific PIs and decide from there? Like, how do you find a PhD? So this is a good yeah. question because I think it's a bit different because undergraduate it's very simple. You go to UCAS. You send your application off, it's good to go. But with a and a master's is quite similar, but I think a PhD is a little bit different. There's one website called findaphd.com, which I will link down below. I'll just link it here. Um, I did have a, a, a video about finding PhDs, so yeah. I'll leave that there as well. But you can go to findaphd.com and you can find search for different topics and look at what where PhDs are around the world and also um, how much they pay and things like that. And that's how I found my PhD. Other ways is you can go to the uni website. So for example, if you go to ucl.com and go to their opportunity, I think their jobs or opportunities, I think it's down under, yeah. and then look at PhD studentships. Like there's, there'll be a bit there. Um, and then you can see what PhDs there are. Sometimes they're not linked on findaphd.com or other websites. So you may have to go to each university separately. Okay, so that's the second way. Third way is you have to just literally email supervisors. Yeah. So you have to email professors and say, look, I'm interested in your work are there any opportunities for me in your lab do you have funding for me to work with you and that's the other way because sometimes the pis have the money but they don't necessarily they're not necessarily thinking about finding someone or they don't want the effort of trying to find someone because it is quite a long process for them to put an application online and search for people and this and that so if you bring yourself forward send your cv with a cover letter show that you're interested it's possible that they might have the money um to hire you so I would say those are the three ways that you can find PhDs or word of mouth. So if you're already in a lab and you're interested in a PhD, then maybe your supervisor can hook you up with another lab. Some of the PhDs that I was offered uh, was through Find a PhD. Yeah. It was Oxford University, Loughborough, that's how I've applied for them. Um, others, it was through the uh, website. Okay. I think in the department that I was in, there was this application, it was a long mm -hmm. application that I went through, was interviewed, and then I already got like um, the EPSRC support. So it's one of the mm -hmm. bodies yeah. where you, that, that fund you. And then I emailed the supervisor that I wanted to work with because I knew that, that's, that he was doing the sort of research mm -hmm. that I was really interested in. I've literally sent him an email and I was like, look, I'm interested in working with stem cell research. Um, this is the sort of experience that I have. I've done summer projects, like my mm -hmm. master's project was metabolic engineering. Okay. At the same time, during that same summer, I've done um, this other project which was like on diabetes yeah. and rats and stem cells. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I would say the best two ways is either find a phd.com yeah. yeah. or literally contact yeah. the supervisor directly. directly. Go onto uni websites and go to departments and go and look at who's in the department. Yeah. And they always give you their contact details in there. Yeah. And sometimes you'll come across their lab website. So some, some labs have their own website and on there it'll say opportunities are available, please contact us. Any fears or hesitations before studying your PhD? A few. Okay. okay. <laughs> I did my masters, I decided to take a year out because I was thinking I need to be a hundred percent sure that this is what I wanted yeah. to do. Um, actually at the time I was like, you know, I want to go into graduate school, either medicine or like doing a PhD like I thought to myself, there is no way that I can see myself doing anything, anything else, else yeah. without doing one of these two first. Yeah. I, I had one little one. The younger especially, you have this idea that by 25, I'm going to have a house, have a car, I'm going to be married, I'm going to have a child by 25. Yeah. And like, now I think, especially now I think, I feel like the younger generation understand that's not realistic. Yeah. Like my siblings, they don't think like that. Yeah. But that's because they've seen me and they've seen, like they're on social media, so they can see people that are older that are yeah. not in that position. But when I was growing up, I didn't see anyone else. So in my head, I thought 25 is a number where you have everything done. It just feels like, because in your head you think, I'm still a student. And when you're a student, there's this like stigma on students, like you don't have money, you don't have anything. But really a PhD, you're a student, but you're not a student. So you're a student because you obviously are still being examined and you're still having an education. But you're not because you're being paid. And like you're being paid a decent salary, you're being paid like a starting salary of like a doctor because we're not, we're not being taxed. How so, do you juggle an education and a social life? 
it's so difficult. The way that I juggle it is I just try to make sure that I've my, I prioritize my education, so I make sure that I've done my revision that I needed to do, like when I was at university or school, did my revision that I need to do, done my coursework on time, so I always, always, always plan my coursework, like if I had coursework due in for Monday, I would make sure that it's done two weeks before, or, you know, and then I can check it, edit it, things like that, so I planned all my courses, that's all done, I'm not leaving anything to the last minute, unless, like, it's an emergency or something, but trying to balance the two, prioritizing your education because that's the most important thing but then also making sure that you don't miss out on your social life so i would say to book things book things that you can't cancel so like if you want to book an event that you want to go to or book a holiday book it because you can't cancel it so you will make time around that so obviously don't do it too often but every couple of months have an have the opportunity where you can book something um, that you can't cancel that you have to go to it but then that, that will make sure that you've done what you need to do with the education and then you can go and enjoy yourself with your social life. Choose people that are going to encourage that lifestyle. So choose people that have a similar mentality. So friends that want to study so you can go and study with them and then you know that afterwards we can go out and play. So you're not with friends that are like, let's go out, let's go out. So you're trying to battle yourself. Like, do I go out? Do I have an education? Like, stop making excuses. There are 24 hours in the yeah. day. Are you telling me that the whole day you're going to be in the lab? What I used to do is I was efficient with my time in the lab because I used to, uh, you know, organize the protocols, yeah. know that the reagents were there. And then I used to do loads of experiments in parallel. Yeah. Some people would do one experiment, two experiments during that day. I'll be doing all these experiments in parallel at the same time. Yes, it was tiring, but at the same time, I had the time to mm. do, to, you know, to look at the social mm. aspect. And these are not just hobbies. You are learning something from it. I, you know, I was able to become like a science communicator because I was performing and I was singing in front of like hundreds of, of people yeah. and you know talking in front of like a small bunch <laughs> of people compared to singing when yeah. your voice is shaking completely different things people used to make me yeah. feel really guilty yeah. for doing all these other things and I was like when I wasn't doing them I felt lazy you know I would be spending my time watching TV and other yeah. things but rather than watching TV I could be doing all these other things and so you know there is, you, there is a lot of time, yeah, it's there's just a lot of time. how efficient you but, are. Yeah. Yeah. My PhD applications have been rejected probably over 20 times. Not sure what I am doing wrong. If you look at your experience, so do you have enough experience? Because I think that's the one thing that like PIs look at. So look at your PhD, look at your um, application and say to yourself, how many years experience do I have? If I don't have that much, then most likely I'm getting rejected because of that. They look at the way that you're phrasing things. Are you being too vague? Are you being very specific about things? Um, I would also say like try to name some research papers in your statement to be able to um, to again to show that you've done your background reading. You don't have to know them off by heart. Like no one's asking that, but just to show that you've done some extra reading. Um, also, the labs that you apply to, I would say take a look at them and say um, look at some papers and tailor each personal statement to that lab. Both look at PhD uh, statements as well, so if you want, you can feel free to send them to us um, and we'll let you know um, the more details, but you can send send your statements to Fast Munich and to me if you want. We both have quite similar, but PhD. we cannot possibly answer them all today, it's just not physically possible. Yeah. I think we're going to leave it there, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Please do leave us any other questions you might have down below, um, we will try to do a part two another time, maybe in a week or two, um, but do leave us any questions and like I said, I will leave Fatimina's social media here and um, you can contact her if you want anything to do with personal statements, engineering, applying into PhDs, UCL, Feel free. everything else. She's a jazz singer as well. What else do you do? Please make sure that you like this video because we've tried to put in some work here. Um, and leave us a comment and don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next one. Bye! Bye! <laughs>